Let's see, first, uh, Shane, you're coming up. And, and I think, um, is Anthony coming up with you? Yeah, Anthony's coming up on the chair. Sit down first here, I'll grab a chair. And Senator Sears is not here today. He's having his hand operated on. Oh. So he'll be back tomorrow. All right. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, Shane Lynn, Champlain Valley Dispensary and uh, Southern Vermont Wellness. Yep, Anthony Brock, I'm representing uh, Vermont Patients Alliance. Monique McHenry apologizes. She had a scheduled conference today. It's not available to be present. Thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, the time being spent on the medical bill. And at this time, uh, with uh, legalization of uh, cannabis last year for adults, uh, we've seen a real impact on the dispensary program at this point. And we've had some suggestions here that uh, probably over the past year and talking to our patients and hearing what their needs and wants are and uh, have come up with a list of items to help streamline uh, the dispensary program and create some efficiencies and reduce the hardships uh, for patients to sign up to the program. Uh, one of those uh, areas is removing the three month uh, uh, consulting relationship with a healthcare professional, we'd like to remove that because that does create an undue burden uh, for patients wanting to sign up for the medical program. Uh, we'd, we would love to see um, medical uh, patients using cannabis make the process as easy as going to see the doctor like any other uh, potential prescription that they use. And so that uh, removing that three month uh, period would help with that. Uh, along with that, we'd like to recommend removing uh, patients currently have to designate a dispensary, pick a dispensary. They can change if they'd like to, but we'd like to remove that requirement that, um, that they have to pick one and, and back to allowing patients, if they're traveling in Chittenden County or Wyndham County, to uh, visit the dispensary in either uh, county without having to be on the registry list just for one. Uh, we think that would be important, and we hear that from our patients quite a bit. Um, we also would like to uh, suggest uh, possession limits to increase for home, home grow for, cultivate, uh, for medical patients growing at home. We'd like to increase their, their plant counts to three mature plants instead of two. Uh, we'd also like to increase the ability of the, a patient to buy three ounces instead of two ounces every 30 days. Uh, we do hear from patients uh, that, you know, that do use uh, cannabis over the years, but they do build up a tolerance. And so being able to, to purchase additional uh, amount of uh, dried flour or edibles would be helpful for them. Um, let's see here. Next step would be uh, we'd uh, like to see the registry uh, include out-of-state registered patients so that you wouldn't have to be a Vermont uh, resident to use the medical program. Uh, we do have people that obviously travel here, uh, vacation here for maybe a week or two weeks. They're not comfortable traveling with medical cannabis. This would give them ability to, to visit a dispensary and make a purchase if they have a medical card in another state. Uh, so then, uh, then they could have access to medicine. And again, with uh, you know, cannabis still being federally legal, traveling with cannabis uh, is uh, against the law over state lines. Um, Another suggestion we have is a reduction uh, with the fees uh, for people that have chronic disease, people that may have HIV, AIDS, uh, MS, you know, disease that um, really is uh, something that's going to be with them the rest of their lives, that they wouldn't have to sign up every year and pay $50, go to a doctor, that they could sign up one time and uh, not have to renew every year. That um, is seems like an undue burden for folks, um, so we'd like to remove that burden. Um, we'd also in in removing if a pay, where currently I'll back out currently our inventory is based on the number of patients that we have in the program, uh, and so may it be our dry flower inventory or the number of plants that we have if we have 100 patients we have to make sure our inventory matches kind of they're, they're in sync uh, if we are able to remove the designation of a dispensary for a patient we'd like to remove the, the kind of the uh, inventory limits that are placed on us currently so that we can just operate as a, as a business and manage that as any other business does and 
Uh, I think over the past six years, we've demonstrated that um, uh, our compliance with the law in the past and, and that we can manage our inventories and security systems to, to guard that. Um, we have talked about testing in the past. We've always supported testing. Uh, currently, we uh, do potency testing on all our products. Uh, we also work with VPA uh, in testing one another's products to ensure that the accuracy in our potency testing. Uh, we do not have the systems for microcontaminants testing. Um, that would probably be a three to five hundred thousand dollar investment, uh, something that we're not able to do. We have talked to the Ag Department and Kerry before. Um, and I think the Ag Department is, is, is ready for potentially testing us uh, on those other issues or um, areas of concern. Uh, we would invite that. We'd invite the DPS to, to take the samples and be able to bring them to the Ag Department to be tested. Uh, we'd also do feel, though, with our $25,000 uh, licensing fee, uh, that those tests should be included in that. You know, to have additional costs potentially in the range of another five, ten, or fifteen thousand dollars would uh, would be a burden on us, and I think we'd hope that it could come out of the current licensing fee structure. Um, and then lastly, uh, last year, which was great, uh, PTSD was put on uh, the, the qualifying list of conditions. Uh, there was uh, a little burdensome, though, that they had to have multiple healthcare providers certify that for them. Uh, and again, in light of uh, cannabis being legal here now in Vermont, it would be great if people with PTSD uh, didn't have to have additional steps to sign up for the registry. Uh, and uh, removing some of those burdens, again, would help the program survive. Um, the goal here is to have a medical program that will uh, endure some of the challenges that are currently in place with, with the change of canvas last year uh, and have it um, you know survive into the future years those are kind of a real quick brief on some of our requests uh, happy to answer questions and Anthony's uh, available as well I just are, are these all in the draft we, they are in the draft, right? Oh, the PTSD is not. The PTSD is not. That would be an extra ad. I'm sorry, and what, what were you asking on the PTSD? Uh, the, to eliminate the counseling? Yes. So the, the healthcare professional would make just a determination that the, we wouldn't have to go to multiple. Well, yes, just to have one uh, physician just like a, any other person currently mm -hmm. on the registry. Because um, that is an extra step, it's an extra bill, most likely. You know, it's additional time, uh, probably more stress as well. Uh, and so, are you okay on that? I mean, do you know yeah. where we are? So, uh, did you, another question, Jeanette? Did you no. have a question? Joe? No. So, I had a question with we had had a little discussion about this before with regard to shopping at different dispensaries, you know, being able to go to whichever one you choose. And so for doctors, there's the, with regard to prescription, there's the prescription monitoring piece that they have to do. What what would be the preventative from a patient going to, I mean, you know the answer to this one already, going to your shop one day and the next day going to another shop? You can have a piece of software, so a third party piece of software um, exists. I worked in Arizona in the, in the medical market there, and all of the programs talk to each other. And so if you visit a dispensary, let's say at our, our location in North Phoenix, and make a purchase of an ounce there, and you went to our location in East Mesa Phoenix, it would not allow that patient to make a purchase because the program talks to each other. So, so it would know that that, per, that patient had already reached their limit for whatever window was preset by state regulation. And of course, this is not in place now. I mean, how much would something like that cost? That software is not that expensive. Traditionally, it's uh, NJ Freeway or, or you know, any um, any piece of software that's basically developed can monitor that type of purchase limit. So, with regard to that, I'm thinking we should put that in the bill that we would talk to each other. Yes, you can mandate those types of, of things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So currently, uh, like, yeah. Um, well, I think. State has had issues with databases in the past, and so finding the right one might be uh, uh, take some time. Uh, currently, the dispensaries, each of the 
MJ Freeway is the software we currently use, and so we do track at each of our dispensaries. I'm not sure if you're on MJ Freeway. Uh, so our different locations, we can definitely track uh, a patient's purchase every 30 days. It'd be something different for the state potentially to be checking each dispensary's, you know, uh, purchases. Um, what what could happen instead of just software at the state level is that a dispensary at the end of 30 days could send an Excel spreadsheet to the government, to the DPS, and the DPS could see if people were uh, basically shopping at different dispensaries at that point. Um, but what I'm saying is in our own dispensaries, we could track uh, every 30 between, days. Between each other? Yes. Between each other. Yep. You could, you could all do that if you put that in. Uh, well, there's a lot of pieces to do. There's a lot of pieces there for sure. So um, I think currently we leave it up to the the patient. If the patient has more than they're supposed to have, well, they're in violation going. of the law. I, I, I mean that's yeah, personal responsibility. The same as we do with non patients. Yep. They could get as much as they wanted to from wherever they wanted to, but if they're they have more than they're allowed by law, then they're in violation. And that's where we could track at our each individual dispensaries. We could see a patient coming in each day, track that for every 30 days to ensure that we're not overselling. Yeah. If that person know we're potentially going to another dispensary, then they would potentially be breaking the law if they went over those limits. And we could let them back to personal responsibility uh, if the state didn't have the capability to track all that. May not be DBS after, depending on what happens on the other building going. Right, but that will be um, a year and a half yeah. away. Right. It's still DPS for a year. Yeah, I think it's a year and a half. And is yeah, in fact, I guess the current bill with uh, tax regulate. I'm not sure if there's any tracking in that one either. And so. I don't no. remember it. No. Yeah. No. So I think that our program, no. you know, would be very similar then if we didn't have a software at the DPS, it would just be following the TNR model uh, and back to the personal uh, individual responsibility. Yeah. All right. Um, any more questions for Shane? Oh, yes, so Michelle. I'm sorry. Follow, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I just want to follow up on that testing issue. Because yeah. um, Senator Sears had at the last when we were done walking the discussion around uh, was concerned around um, uh, dispensaries testing their own products, and we talked about the fact that there really isn't any requirement in statute or rule well around testing. I mean, you have to do it, you have to make sure that your labeling is correct yep. and if you're in compliance with that, but. So I had been looking a little bit at what were the possibilities, and we have the new language expanding the Ag Lab's authority to be able to be testing for cannabis, and so we'll hear from Harry about that. But I was wondering about you know, whether or not there's capacity at all right now for, like if you weren't doing your own testing, if, and, and either for Ag to be doing it but for others, like I don't, it, I'm just wondering about is the system big enough with only five dispensaries to be to I, require you guys to do testing, but not to test yourself? I'd say no, in the sense of the of the, uh, the business scale of uh, there being a third party lab out there being able to afford uh, the kind of the, the smaller samples that we'd be providing, and, and we would look to Ag to work with us on on doing those other testing. So basically. We can test in-house on our potency. Uh, we can then have Ag certify our testing, which is in the in the bill, basically, uh, so that we're our standard operating procedures, our methods are approved by Ag, and then Ag could be doing audits on, on our uh, on our testing in the sense of either coming to our facility, uh, production facility, uh, to audit the lab itself, and or going to the dispensary. You could have the DPS get uh, products at the dispensary, bring them to the Ag department and the Ag Department could do those tests to ensure there's no contaminants or to uh, ensure potency and accuracy. Um, but it is, um, you know, back to the costs involved in that, and Carrie can probably speak more to the cost of having a, a fully operational lab just for uh, five uh, dispensaries. It's, um, I don't think that lab would be able to support itself. Um, 
because the investment would be considerable. You know, we're talking probably a million dollars uh, of investment and then the staffing of that. So uh, again, we'd look for the ag to basically certify our processes, to say yes, your methods are correct methods, and then they, uh, the DPS could uh, be doing audits, bringing those samples to the ag department to ensure that our methods are working uh, and that uh, they're consistent and, um, and accurate. And do you think that the language that's in there now would, would be sufficient? I think the, I, I, I think there's some deep, there's probably more detail that's needed and I know that would probably occur during rulemaking, I would assume. Uh, but the overall framework for it working is in there. Um, and again, Carrie could probably speak more clearly to uh, the number of times potentially uh, that they'd have to make visits or the sample size. You know, there's a lot of detail that does need to be flushed out. Uh, but the framework, again, is, uh, is in there for, for AG and DPS to be working to ensure that uh, our methods are certified uh, and accurate. So I'm just thinking about if, if, if folks can be thinking about what, if anything, we can do would do to tweak the staff, the language in the bill to make sure that that could happen if that's what the committee wants to do to address the, 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 the testing issue. Um, just because not, um, if, we, if, we do leave, if we do push it to rules, it's going to be another year. Uh, and so I'm just wondering about if there are some little things, not that they wouldn't still go through and adopt rules at, 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 with a little greater detail, but I'm wondering if there's anything we can do in the bill that kind of gets a little closer to having the verification of the testing so that accomplishes your goals here in a little quicker time period than waiting for another year for, for rules to be developed. So are you asking? I was just thinking, I, that, I mean, I can talk to people together. offline about it. Uh, how to, right, I'm okay. just trying to think about, because I know yeah. Senator Sears expressed that, and yeah. you guys said, well, yeah, that makes sense, and I'm trying to think about how do you get a little closer to there being verification of the testing processes um, so by utilizing the Ag Lab uh, yeah. without having to wait for another year cycle for rulemaking. Right, so Senator Sears had mentioned the issue of you know, a conflict of interest you're testing your own product. Mm -hmm. And so this this addresses that in terms of just the lab. You know. Yeah, in the sense that, hey, uh, ag is coming in to certify the testing, and then that there would be an audit potentially throughout the year to make sure that the results were accurate. Um, and again, Carrie can attest to that kind of uh, program and, um, uh, and back to that, you know, getting a, a certification from the Ag Department. Basically in the lab world, there's a lot of different methods to testing for the cannabinoids, uh, especially when it comes to edibles and the different sugars and different ingredients in the edibles. And so having the right method to, you know, determine in that cookie how many milligrams of cannabis are in there. Uh, it could be different for all the different uh, edibles, brownie or cookie. And so the Ag Department would come in and say, all right, you have the right method in, in determining how much cannabis is in that cookie. And then we do those tests with that method that they have certified. Uh, and then they'd come in and do an audit over the year and say, all right, we, we took that cookie off the shelf. We're going to go back. We're going to test it to make sure the numbers are the same numbers that you were putting on the label. And at that point, if they're not, you know, you could have a, um, a three-strike system of, hey, you've got a, a letter of warning, a uh, second strike. Uh, again, Kerry probably has procedures like that in, in other areas that they test for. Um, and, and then back to contaminants, that would be the same, same process, basically, to ensure. Because uh, we've worked with Ag Department over the years at this point for standard operating procedures and what we can or can't put on the plant uh, and so that part is um, you know it's one it's one thing like in the future potential tax regulate market where you don't know where the cannabis is coming from or which grower or, or whatever but with us being vertically integrated we're very uh, uh, you know we know exactly what has got into the plants and on the plants so we don't have any questions about that and we're confident about the final product uh, however, that does change uh, as the marketplace opens up and you start to have wholesale and uh, a lot more uh, businesses operating. So with this, you might be buying other products, other, other people's? Currently, the dispensary program can have wholesale, yeah. so we can purchase from VPA. We do have a program right now between VPA and CBD where we purchase dried flour, we purchase edibles from one another. 
Uh, and so this program that is currently outlined here would help ensure that those numbers for potency are accurate and that there are no contaminants and that that would be administered <coughs> through the DPS working with the act. Go ahead. Shane, if somebody comes in to you and shows you a Vermont medical card, do you have a way of cross-checking that against something? Yeah, we get an updated list every Friday from the DPS. Uh, and so every Friday we get an, you know, a spreadsheet saying here are the current numbers uh, on your registry that have designated you. So um, if somebody comes in from Nevada and shows you a Nevada card, how would you cross-check against that to see if it's uh, We'd have to assume and, you know, we'd probably have to educate our uh, sales associates to distinguish between a fake and a, and a valid card, just as like with drinking, you know, in the sense that uh, obviously, there could be forgeries, but that we would uh, ensure that we had samples of the other states' cards and we could verify those cards. We wouldn't be able to call the state, though, uh, to verify it. I just, well, I, I just do have, um, I understand the, uh, the three months that getting rid of that. And we did we did eliminate that for um, the people who have terminal illnesses, right? So yes, they could. Um, yeah. Yes, for sure. Uh, people that are uh, hey, uh, diagnosed with cancer or terminal illness, uh, the state call right. the state, call in Z, uh, and you can get on the program uh, immediately. Immediately, but, yep. but so if we eliminated it entirely, it still is up to the physician. Yep. to make the decision. And if the physician feels that he or she doesn't know the patient well enough, doesn't have enough contact with them, <coughs> then the, the doc isn't going to sign off on it, Correct. I would assume. Yes, the health, so it puts health, the yeah. responsibility in the hands of the, making the, the doc making the decision about how well they know the patient. Healthcare professionals are, are the gatekeepers to get yeah. in on the program. Okay, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'd like to ask oh. Michelle a question, actually. Yeah. Um, Michelle, if we're changing the language of registered patient to eliminate the residency requirement, there's still language here that says the person has been issued a registration card by the department. So right. how would somebody from Nevada hold a right. card? So I'm sorry, I, I missed that part of Shane's testimony, but I think you would have to, um, is it that you're asking for reciprocity from another yes. state? So basically, if you are from another state, um, are you are you looking for basically if you qualified another state that you would automatically be able to qualify for the registry and then they would get their own Vermont card or it's somebody who is like just visiting and they could use their card? Exactly. Yeah, if you're from Massachusetts, you're driving up, uh, you're here in Vermont for two weeks, you'd right. like to use the dispensary program. Maine has a similar law in the sense of reciprocity of right. other states. So it, that's not in the bill is introduced. You'd have to change that. Yeah. Yeah. But if somebody moved here, presumably they would end up getting a Vermont. Yes, card. for sure. Yeah. Yep. And then if they had a card from another state, though, they could be using that while they apply to the Vermont. Yes, yeah. and, and kind of, uh, you know. Get their doc here. Yep. Okay. So, if I might, yes. if we put a number of these changes in place, would we be saying that someone, so this asks for three ounces. Um, so someone from another state could come here with their car, buy three ounces here, and drive out of state. That could be a potential back to the personal responsibility. Would be, yeah. you know, take a chance to see. It'd be illegal. illegal. No, I understand. Um, illegal. Yeah. But, you know, three ounces is we've always been talking yeah. about lesser amounts. Three ounces is a quite a lot of product, I would say. Yeah, and a lot of these requests are a reflection of last year and having yep. legalized uh, cannabis here in Vermont <clears throat> and back to some of the realities of being able to, you know, purchase cannabis even on Church Street at this point. Um, you know, this is really uh, trying to make the medical program uh, updated so that um, we can have a uh, uh, more sustainable business at this point.
I'm, I have to say that's, and, and I understand that's a reason for being for, for you, but for me that's the least compelling of the reasons that we've been talking about. Um, and I felt this way during the discussion of the recreational bill too. Adult use. Uh, adult use bill. Um, you know, the dispensaries, I understand, are now uh, anxious about their market share. But I don't think that we can be in the business of ensuring a market. Um, I think the concern should be the medical situation of the patients. Best uh, connection between that and public safety. And then if it also grows your market, that's one thing. But I, I, I felt at points during that discussion and at points looking at this is that what we're really doing is putting a, a thumb on the scale to make sure that a market stays there. So if, if someone can get a card and buy three ounces, um, at a time. Uh, Currently, they can get two ounces. And so right, but, it, but I mean, we're three ounces begins to look like, uh, I don't know, just it strikes me differently. So I'm just saying, I, I see on the back of this sheet, it talks about PTSD patients will be able to purchase marijuana on their own. Why would they choose to go through this process? I guess from my point of view, if they don't choose to go through this process, I, I, don't, I don't have a worry about that. Um, in other words, I'm not, as you are, I'm, I'm not worried about necessarily whether the dispensaries maintain a robust market share against the adult use market. Um, just as, as uh, two competitors in the marketplace, I'm, I, I don't, I don't really want to put my thumb on the scale in that way. Uh, I, yeah, and I guess the right back to hey, market share versus sustainability yeah. of the marketplace. And so if you start to look at roughly you know 5,300 patients on the register right now, five businesses serving 5,300 people, um, you know, and then a future tax regulate market that could have potentially 80,000 people on it. Uh, the reality of that business model is. Uh, it's unbalanced, you know? And I think some of this approach is how do we find a level playing field as things start to change here uh, to ensure that we can have uh, some efficiencies in our operations. Because uh, some of this is, is about, uh, or a lot of it is about, uh, being able to supply the patients the products that they need. Uh, it be a certain milligram dose that they need or a certain flower or strain uh, and that consistency, consistency in doing that. Because um, there get to be real challenges in having <coughs> diversity of products. Uh, the smaller the market, like any business, the smaller your market is, to have uh, 300 SKUs isn't possible. And so where do we find that balance to make sure that we're offering not only the service and the products to, to folks, um, uh, it's really important that we do, you know, back to your wording of, of market share, it, it's more that we do have a, um, a program that's sustainable and if you look to other states usually it's about three percent of the population that uses medical cannabis uh, Vermont is under one percent at this point and so some of this is uh, you know how can we provide a easier access for more Vermonters to come into the program um, to purchase cannabis um, I, I agree with your point if I can chime in there you know when a patient comes to a dispensary to purchase something that they grow across Vermont to. Um, being new to Vermont, I've been here just under a year now, and a lot of people live in rural communities. There's you know, less than 10 dispensaries total across the state. If you're a patient in a little area that drives to a dispensary on that day, and you could acquire as much cannabis as possible, let's say three ounces, as a PTSD patient, maybe that person uses quite a bit of cannabis, or if it's a severe pain patient, whatever condition they may have, they want to stock up. Again, speaking to supply, knowing uh, smaller scale types of grows here in Vermont, it is very difficult to keep strains in stock. So when we grow um, batches and we have certain strains that are highly desired, we can't service the entire patient population of the dispensary with the grows that we currently have. So we have, have to grow small amounts of everything all the time. And so when a patient comes in and they say, wow, this strain really works for me, they want to be able to, to sometimes buy as much as they can of that strain at that point and go home with it. 
And so that's a great advantage and increasing the possession amount at that time I think is a, is a good idea. Um, I, I just feel yeah, pretty strong, pretty strong that's, about that. That's mm -hmm. a great point. Um, you know, back to these strains, you know, they're like uh, other products out there. Some uh, really do work uh, better than others. The uh, patients seem to like certain things. You start growing one strain, uh, and then it does shift, you know, potentially after eight to nine months, something shifts, and you're like, oh, now people are buying this strain. And so you shift your productions. And so for us, that means looking six to eight months ahead to make that change, though. Because if someone says, hey, if we, we don't have enough of this strain, it literally will take six months to eight months to grow more of it. And that means we have to remove something and stop growing that other, we don't just add on, we're not able to do that with an expansion. So something has to come out of the rotation. Uh, and so those are some of the, you know, the tensions and back to being able to, you know, patients, uh, you know, have personal preferences. And so I do think some people would definitely uh, be, be purchasing, you know, potentially three ounces then of, of what they like uh, and works for them for symptom relief. Um, and then there's the folks that are using, you know, potentially for Rick Simpson oil and, and other things at home that they're uh, maybe making and need these quantities to, to make uh, their own formulas. And so uh, that, that's, you know, that, that's the request uh, that we've heard from people. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. Yeah. So, Anthony, did you have some testimony you wanted to give? Um, basically, uh, I, I don't have a, a major points to use. I think Shane hit on, on basically everything. I would just say that I, I would love to discuss further, as I'm sure everyone would, the, the testing parameters, and Carrie will obviously have lots of information to give around those, and, and you know, basically making them consumer safety-minded above everything. It's not about convenience for dispensaries or cost to the state. It's about consumer safety, and I, I feel strongly about that. I'm just making, you know, making sure that the products that are hitting the shelves are safe for consumption having common sense rules in place around that so that it's not impeding uh, dispensaries from being able to do business and also uh, a bottleneck at the testing level so that people actually have access. Um, that's what I've seen in my experience in other states and as, as two things that can happen. It can, can become very costly for the businesses to do the testing and it can actually be bottlenecked by regulatory uh, testing parameters. I just, yes. did Michelle get the, the language about the, um, do we have an, I see that we're going to be marking this up. Yeah. Do we have enough language around that? Um, we're not going to mark it up no. today. We're oh, gonna, I no, thought it said it, it says it on the chart, but we're not going to. Oh, okay. We're, then never mind. We can spend some time yeah. with that, yeah. maybe after the witnesses, and I'll get what you yes. need, but yeah. then it's scheduled okay. for the week after town meeting. Got it. I okay. just read that line. It did say okay. it on there. Okay. But. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Thanks. for your time. Thanks. So, um, Jessa, Bernard, hi. Hi, Jessa. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Just, did you bring copies? I said, did I send it to you electronically? Yeah. I didn't bring paper copies. Oh, okay. I can bring some. Okay. Sorry. I lose track of which committees still like paper or get it by paper. We're going to spend a lot of time in health and welfare, and they don't. And they don't want paper, so that's on my, that's, yes. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about S117. I'm Jessa Barnard with the Vermont Medical Society, and we shared some of these concerns when you were talking about S54 as well, so I will try not to repeat myself. I know you've heard some of our perspective already. We have a concern with some elements of the, of the proposal, some we have no position on, but I'll just um, highlight the areas that we do have concern. Um, and I appreciate Shane's testimony about um, wanting to treat this like other conditions, and I think in some ways we share that perspective, but our perspective of how to accomplish that may be a little bit um, different and based on what we've seen in other states um, in our experience. So, for example, eliminating the three-month healthcare professional patient relationship. I understand that may be a little bit of a inexact proxy for a meaningful ongoing relationship, so I hear that concern. But I think what, on the flip side, what we've seen in other states that don't have some kind of requirement like that is a, clinics that set up specifically for the purpose and only for the purpose of signing the paperwork to participate in the um, registry program. And we, we, in fact, saw a clinic like that try to open in Burlington um, pretty recently, but there are, I mean, it's in pretty much many states, um, Maine, Colorado, California. And so if we're saying we want this to be treated like other conditions, I think those, and, and again, it's the, it, the requirement would be on the health professional to be operating appropriately, but um, there should be requirements like other health 
professionals have in terms of being available for ongoing follow-up. Follow -up. I would like to see them have EHR, electronic health record, so they can share information with other providers and so other providers know. So my concern is people go in, they get the card, no one else currently in the system may know about that. So it is treated differently than, or it's not, it's not exactly parallel because of, um, it, because of some of the problems with cannabis just being illegal, but also I think the way some of these clinics set up for, the sh sort of for this purpose alone. Um, and I would like to see an explicit requirement that they're meeting current standards of care as other health professionals would for a meaningful patient-provider relationship. Um, Can I ask a question yes. before you move on to the yes. topic? How would someone coming from out of state be able to meet this requirement? I'm oh, sorry, which requirement? The the three well, requirement. there are already exceptions, and Senator White alluded to this. There are exceptions for patients who have recently moved to the state, patients changing health care providers, recent diagnoses. So I think as time has gone on, the legislature has, I think, added appropriate exceptions. So if somebody is, you know, it's a new, you haven't been diagnosed for three months, you've just moved to the state, you actually already have exceptions to that requirement. Let me be clearer. Oh, I'm sorry. If I'm coming here to ski yes. from South Carolina, and all of a sudden I pop up with my South Carolina medical card. Right. How is it if this provision is um, kept in place that someone would have access to our medical Well, I think that's a good question. I, again, since that wasn't in the current draft, I didn't have that in mind when I was looking at when responses. I actually am not sure we'd have a concern with reciprocity for other cards, except for the questions one, I think maybe you asked about making sure it's a legitimate card and how do you verify. I don't, um, I don't know what the out-of-state requirements would be. But right. We would have for you have your own right. requirement with, of a relationship with the doctor, but how do we know South Carolina would have anything so I think that's like many instances of state law. When you the age you can get married, how early you can get your driver's license. I mean, we, I think we have reciprocity with different requirements in, in many similar instances like that. So I don't, I'm not, I'd have to think about that a little further. I don't think that's a major area of concern for us. I mean, obviously, they would, they could have different requirements. I don't know. I'd have to think, again, since it wasn't in the proposal, I hadn't thought through all the details of that. So I had, it, it had not even dawned on me that somebody would set up a clinic for this purpose. So unless there, maybe we should require a CON for them and get rid of all parking lot clinics. Sorry about No, I mean, I'm not necessarily, there, no, I, I'm not, a, um, I, I mean, I, I, I think there is a good conversation around CON for any, for urgent cares and others. Yeah, that's a topic for another, a, a bigger topic. But, but how do, how do we, mm -hmm. you're right, how, how, if somebody sets up a clinic specifically to verify, to say, to sign off on, they, they don't have the follow up. <coughs> the urgent care centers don't have necessarily follow up and don't provide. Well, anyway, I think I'm, the distinction, I know that's actually it's, it's a good question, but I think again it's a, it's a distinction because um, urgent care supposedly is for time limited, you know, this is a condition that, you know, you need something right now. These, these are, I think. That's not what I've heard is the need for marijuana typically or cannabis. It's no, no, more no, ongoing I, chronic conditions I'm just that to. do require auto follow-up. And I was actually thinking of this as I was preparing my testimony. You know, I, for example, I have type 1 diabetes. To me, the anal and I have to take insulin, I will for the rest of my life. The analogy would be for me going to somebody just to prescribe my insulin right. who doesn't talk to any of my other right, healthcare right, providers. Right, right. And it doesn't even talk to the pharmacy. And it's actually the pharmacy that just determines the dose, the quantity, the formulation, because the physician or whoever is saying you can take insulin doesn't have the information or understanding of the dosing side. So it, it's not an exact yeah, yeah, yeah. parallel between how no. these systems operate. And I, I think our physicians do have concerns about if, as we expect, these clinics may become in Vermont, they're not talking to the rest of the healthcare system or operating like the rest of the healthcare system. And one was what just trying to set up in Burlington? Correct. It's in the it's in the there's actually a link in our testimony to the some of the press coverage about it. And they okay. were quoted as saying that the three month requirement was a limiting factor on that because it was hard for them to get people back. It, they had to see people and then have them back in three months. So they're operating in other states already. It's a, it's a sort of a chain of another of a clinic. 
and the other states don't have that requirement, mm -hmm. so that was an impediment to them making a viable business model in Vermont. Can I ask them, are, are, just to strip it down, mm -hmm. are you opposed to lifting the Vermont mm -hmm. I have concerns about that paired with the elimination of this three-month requirement for that exact reason, that I see people, and I lived in California um, about, a, you know, 10 years ago, and this, on every corner, a little green, you know, marijuana leaf, you go in, get your card that day, and then go to the dispensary. So I think if you combine these two, I fully would expect to see a clinic you walk in from any state um, and get the card. And uh, I have to say, I have real questions about lifting this residency requirement, too. To go along with what I was saying before, I, I feel like there's a couple things that work here. One is the desire to make it more attractive to be on the, on the register. Um, so you can buy more. In the recreational bill, there was a, there was a uh, provision about um, discounts um, that we ultimately eliminated, but that was going in the same direction. So try to create real tangible reasons why people would prefer to go to a dispensary, whether they actually needed to or not. And the kind of clinics you're talking about would be the, the gateway that would allow people to do that. I have talked with a number of people from California. I used to live there. I still have lots of friends there. And they told me the exact same thing, that um, in fact, people out there for a time were using a teledoctor in mm -hmm. Arizona. So you went into a room, and on the screen was a doctor in Arizona, and you could get, um, get a card that mm -hmm. way. Right. So, um, so one of the things I've always liked about our, our program here is that I think we've had very few problems because it's been heavily controlled, mm -hmm. and a number of this, uh, pieces of this seem to be trying to lift that control as a way to beef up the market for the dispensaries in anticipation of stiff competition from the adult use market. So I, I think that's something we should be careful about. That's all I'm saying. So if, um, I'm kind of trying to separate 30 day I, I get that. So if we had that, um, if you're an, a New Hampshire resident, <laughs> but you live right over the border, mm -hmm. so your healthcare professional is at Putney Medical Services. So if you're not a Vermont resident, but your healthcare provider is a, in Vermont, that would limit people I, I mean, well, I think you're out of state. If I'm correct in the current law, you can already be a New Hampshire place of health. Oh, sorry, you're doing no, the opposite. No, no. Not a New Hampshire physician. You could be a Vermont resident. Right, in CC. CC. right you're but, saying the opposite. But so, right. I, so I'm not talking about the guy that comes here for two weeks. Mm -hmm. the, we, we can deal with that as reciprocity. But the person who lives in um, Hinsdale, and they have no doctors in Hinsdale, so they all use Brownsboro um, mm -hmm. physicians. Mm -hmm. Should that person be allowed to get, because they're getting their health care in Vermont, mm -hmm. they're using their, uh, getting their prescriptions written by the doctor, and they're going to the hotel pharmacy because there's not a pharmacy in Hinsdale, so, so they're doing everything healthcare-wise mm -hmm. in Vermont. So. Is that, if, if you lifted it so that it didn't have to be a Vermont resident, but they had to be receiving their care from a Vermont provider? I don't think I'd have a concern with your concept. I don't, I, I'd have to think about how to I don't know how the to, drafting how to of that, it, but I don't but think that's a concern. Okay, I so. Don't, I don't think, I think we're less concerned about where the person lives than the meaningful, well, that's what, ongoing, you know, the meaningful relationship. Well, so, there, so there's that. Right. right. And then there's the, I'm trying to separate the two right. issues right. here so that right. we could deal with that for right. that person. Then, right. then there's the three months. Right. Um, and, and I, I, I have concerns about lifting that, May, not because um, it's making it easier for anybody, but because I think that 
there should be some kind of an established relationship with a healthcare provider, but, and I thought that it would be, that the healthcare providers would be conscientious about that, and I think most of them would, but I'm, I am concerned if there are uh, chains that are wanting to set up clinics here for that express purpose. I, I have a concern about that. I want you to get through your testimony. I'm sorry. Sure. No, I'm no sorry. I, I agree. And actually, sorry, and, and actually, my next point, I think, directly relates. I appreciate, Senator Bird, the way you're articulating it. Um, we, sh our philosophy, the, the physician's philosophy, is that this should be an evidence-based program set up to help patients and based on the evidence. And, and exactly as you said, not about how many patients that means or what industry we're helping or not helping. Um, so our concern with removing the list of conditions, as we shared in the S54, is that that is currently where, rightly or wrongly, physicians look to which conditions um, are appropriate for using marijuana since the evidence of it is, hard, is hard to find and not as easy as other FDA-approved medications. We share that if there are other needs or desires of people to use cannabis, they currently can, can grow it and eventually it looks like they will be able to purchase it um, any, for adult use and that if it's not an evidence-based condition, then they will still have access to it if they need it. Um, I, I also see some conflicts with S54. If I'm reading it correctly, as S54 has passed, it still has, a for the medi medical pieces of that bill, <coughs> listed conditions. So you're setting up, if you pass S117 as proposed, you're setting up a conflict where for the next year and a half, there would not be limited conditions. But once it, Chapter 86 goes away, and you're under the whole new framework under S117, there are lists of conditions that the new medical program would be limited to, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, I think that's setting patients and physicians up for confusion. So, so 54, as introduced, had the same language that was in this. And then, based on your testimony, they changed it, and they went back to existing law, and so now, now we still have this as introduced. So they were the same as introduced. And right, so and right, so that, that so that was my understanding of reading it, that you set up a system where for the next year and a half you'd have an expanded program that would then back, or you no, know, change back, um, right. and that, that um, I think is a, is a problem, and we prefer the S54 language and then continuing that consistency um, with how the program would change. Um, my final point is about the eliminating the need for renewal of a patient's registration. I hadn't focused on the fee part. I don't think we, we fee is not, we don't care, you know, or we're fine with there not being a fee, though the DPS may disagree with that. Um, but it, it's again, if we were treating this like other, or trying to treat it as parallel as possible to other medications, um, that would be like saying a patient never needs to get a renewal for a prescription or, or see their clinician again for a renewal of the prescription for other chronic conditions. Again, I have diabetes I'm going to for the rest of my life. I'm going to need insulin for the rest of my life. I still, every year, at least one, you know, I, I see my, have to see them more often than once a year, but at least once a year you need to check in and say, I need a renew I'm still on this medication, I need a renewal. In this case, it's the, current, the language proposed would basically say it's up to the patient to remove themselves from the registry. So it's really giving the patient the determination of is this still of ongoing benefit, are there side effects, is, do we need to check in with a healthcare clinician instead saying the patient can continue forever unless the patient decides it as opposed to the healthcare professional. So you don't object to the removing the fee for those people? I wouldn't, but, no. But um, they would still have to renew, but not have to. I, and again, and I haven't thought, I don't know as much. I, I, I don't have a problem rethinking how that renewal looks or works. I don't think, I don't want it to be an administrative barrier for patients. I just think it does make sense to have at least a check-in with their healthcare professional once a year at that point to see if there's an ongoing need. Because even with chronic conditions, things change or side effects may change. Or yeah. um, So from the healthcare professional perspective, that makes sense yeah. to us. It, it would be different if we didn't charge them a fee, mm. it would be different than the way we do healthcare generally, which is because you have a chronic condition doesn't mean you don't continue to pay for co-pays. Uh, 
Right. Well, it's a little different because they're still paying for the cannabis and they're still paying if they have to have an appointment with their healthcare professional, they'd still be paying for that. Yeah. It'd be saying, I mean, it actually is it a little different of saying basically you need to pay just even to. Um, there's another fee on top of that simply for the filing the paperwork so it would almost be adding a, it's like you, every year if you need to renew your prescription not only do you pay them for the medication but you pay another fifty dollar charge just to file that paperwork so i think there actually does sound like there actually is an additional sort of you know fee on top of yeah. paying for the paying for the cannabis and paying to see your healthcare professional if you have if there's a charge because you don't pay for him to write you a new prescription. Right. You pay him or also her. pay or her, yeah. Yeah, you pay for the appointment and then Plus you pay for the, the prescription, but you don't pay just for another registration fee. Right. right. So those are those are our concerns. Thank you for hearing from us. Happy to be involved or answer questions through the process.
which I don't see in the tax and regulate bill yet. Um, any other questions? We are in the process of uh, moving our laboratory. We got washed out of where we were in 2011 with Irene. We've been squatting at UVM, the Hills Building, until about a week ago. We'll be up and running here after town meeting, after the week of town meeting. So we'll, it was designed for us to move in the winter, not the growth season. Um, and we'll be up and running here shortly. BTC. We're in the cornfield at BTC. <laughs> Field corn. So we are all the all the uh, the list of analytical un analytical work in there. We are currently able to do. Um, the hardest to do is like uh, Shane had mentioned the mycotoxin work. So I guess the question is, um, are you going to have the capacity to do this? So the, as envisioned, and we've talked with DPS and the dispensaries about this, is sort of um, spot checking. Um, so, so yes, yeah. So would spot checking be done on a surprise basis? It doesn't necessarily have to be um, because as envisioned, the dispensaries would be collecting the samples. Um, so whenever the representative from the dispensary or DPS showed up, they would grab a handful of samples and send them to our lab. It could be surprise or not. Um, we've done both for the hemp industry. We've worked with other agency, agencies who've had complaints about something maybe not being held hemp. Taking those samples and run them. Whenever we got a complaint that something wasn't hemp, we went out and checked. But aside from that, of the 400 growers, we checked approximately 10%, just random. And that was primarily for THC compliance, not the other list of components. We have checked other value added retail products as well, uh, CBD products. <coughs> I think it, it's fine. It's language we've seen. Um, I don't know, Michelle, for what, four years in a row now? So <laughs> we're comfortable with it. I see. And is everybody moving to the new lab? Yes. Everybody is? Yeah. Um, no, we lost actually five people who have taken hardship risks um, in the process of refilling those positions, including our lab director. If you wanted to put in there, go live July 1st, we would be capable of all that. You could go live July 1st. Yeah. I'm just wondering about whether or not there needs to be anything more specific around directing there to be the compliance for Um, we, when this was added to a bill last year, we if it didn't pass, we we're moving forward with um, developing an MOU with the Department of Public Safety, um, and we pretty much brought that almost to the fish, finish line. It was uh, paying for samples that. Um, that we didn't sort out. The, the Department of Public Safety, and I, I don't know if Chris Herrick is in the building or not, had proposed that the dispensaries submit samples to us and pay for them and um, themselves. And that was sort of pay for their own testing. That, uh, and the 
also be submitted both the dispensary and DPS. Um, and you've heard testimony today that the, the fee that the dispensaries pay is large enough to cover some some testing. So all all that really needs to happen is that it needs to be sorted out at the commission. Well, the, the language in the bill that you have directs that DPS pays the fee to ag. So that's already sorted out in the bill. I'm just wondering about whether or not there's the committee would want something that directs saying that you know either there shall be an MOU between DPS and Ag, <coughs> you know, on compliance testing. If you want something like that, you don't have to have something like that. Who pays? Who pays? No, nope, you already. It's actually you already have in the in, the, in that Ag lab, It says that DPS pays. I just mean more like directing. To get the idea out there that there's going to be tests, going to be compliance check testing, and that it's going to be, that, and that DPS and Ag have to work together to make that happen. But you don't have to have it. Sounds like they're going to do it anyway. But if you if you would feel more comfortable, well, why don't you put it in and then we'll discuss it again, if you would. I do. Um, any questions? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You've been docking this for a while, haven't you? I think so. <laughs> Thank you. So we're um, we're not doing the markup, so that's what we're going to schedule for the budget. Okay. All right. Okay. I I feel a little bit calmer then. So there was, there was some um, information that we received over the phone with regard to somebody wanting to say a few words, and I emphasize a few words. Um, if someone would like to do that. I'd love to do it. I'm Francesca Thompson. Okay. Francesca Thompson? Yes. Francesca Thompson. Can you just say who you were? Or, or are you Myself. Just a sense. I'm not a patient. I'm actually a medical cannabis success story. Okay. I would love to say I am a Vermont medical cannabis success story, but I'm not. The system completely failed me, and I have a caregiver in Maine that helps me. Um, I live down in Dorset. My access um, was severely um, hindered by locations two dispensaries. Um, my closest dispensary when I began was in Brandon. So it was an hour and a half drive for me. Oftentimes I would get there and um, I wouldn't have access to any medication, any medicine. Um, they didn't have um, anyone that was educated there to really explain what strains were, what they were going to do to me, um, how to take them. I would go in and end up leaving with all this product to go home and test by myself, um, which was extremely costly. I would say that I spent probably on average between one to $2,000 a month. I depleted my 401k. Um, it, it's, the financial impact is enormous on everyone. It's, it's not just the dispensaries. Um, I think that the problem is that the failure is right here at this table. It's the legislator. A, a system was created where the patients and the dispensaries can't succeed. We so many rules and regulations have been put into effect by people that don't necessarily understand the medicine. I think a lot of people think that it's a rec market. A what? A, a, a recreational market. That, that patients aren't necessarily patients. Um, I came down with idiopathic pancreatitis out of nowhere. I rotated in and out of a hospital every two weeks. 
I was put on this opiate supply that I can't even begin to tell you about. It was after my doctors um, put me on fentanyl and I overdosed in front of my children while on my prescribed medication that I decided that opiates were no longer going to be something that were viable for me. Cannabis was viable. Only I had to figure it out on my own. And I think that if the patients and the dispensaries were to come together to figure out how to care for the patient, there's no empathy. Nobody feels the patient's pain. I would throw up for an hour and a half on my way to a dispensary <clears throat> to get there to try to figure out how I wasn't going to be sick anymore. If the patients and the dispensaries were talking about what strains were working, if there wasn't so much legislation blocking this commingling of patients and caregivers, we might be able to go forward, but I fear that this is so broken at this point that the only place to start is the bottom. You can't keep on nitpicking this and adding and subtracting because ultimately the patient care isn't changing. The patients are still stuck in the system. The dispensaries are stuck trying to figure out how to care for the patients. I am going to Maine. Oh, and have a caregiver in Maine. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish it. I'll ask you a question. Because I am able to find a state system which supports patient care. I think the patient is getting lost here in what could be achieved if caregivers were brought into the system more. I think that the patients need to be recognized as human beings. I, th I think that we aren't criminals. We're, we're kind of treated like them. We have lock boxes that we have to bring in to these dispensaries. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I understand. My point is that this is a legal substance in our state that's still being treated as though it's illegal on many levels. And I think that the first thing that has to really be reined in is the care of the patient and how to achieve that. And can we really go backwards from where we are right now and achieve that for the patient. Okay. I, Did you want to say a little more? Can we ask you some questions? No, please, please. And I, I apologize. Um, this was last minute for me. This has been really difficult for me. You're doing fine. So to come and put myself out here. So I apologize. Please ask away. Yes. So I'm trying to understand. I I take the point about it needing to be centered on the patient. I'm just wondering, so you're talking about people at the dispensaries not knowing how to instruct the patient and a lack of empathy, mm -hmm. but are those things that are the fault of the legislation or of the way a specific dispensary is being run? I think that with words, the way that everything is so vertically done, you're putting a lot of responsibility upon the dispensaries to serve many different capacities. And can they be expected to serve as the, ind the, the entity that is providing all of that? I, I, I think that the patients need caregivers. I think that before 
I think we have to start at the patient and the individual. And as it is now, I think that it's hard for the patients and the dispensary to be utilized in an efficient manner. And I think that the legislation causes the hurdles and the blocks to be there. I, I think that a system that takes who's going to, to care for these patients first and foremost first. It's, I, I, um, so I, I, um, I hear your frustration. But I also have to tell you that, first of all, this is a product that hasn't been legal until a few months ago. So it wasn't a legal product. And when, when we first um, established the dispensaries, because that was my committee that did that, mm -hmm. it was with the patient in mind. Because we had patients coming to us and saying, I've got a card. I can do this, so where am I supposed to buy this? Am I supposed to buy this on the street? Am I supposed? We had an 87-year-old woman who came in and said, am I supposed to ask my grandson where I can get this? And we said, no, that doesn't make any sense. We need to set up dispensaries. But, and I'm not trying to um, justify it, but what, there's 180 people in this building, and we needed to convince at least 16 people in the Senate and 76 people in the House and the governor to sign. And there was a lot of fear. This is, we've had 50, 60 years of <coughs> hearing this product. So we had to do something, we had to set it up in a way that would pass. And that, that is the reality. We, if we had not done that, we, we wouldn't have dispensaries at all now. So I'm, I, I am a little confused about why there are restrictions. And there, until this product is um, somehow recognized as not a, a threat, there will always be some restrictions. But I'm confused about why you feel that the, the way it's set up does not allow, doesn't allow the patients to work with the dispensaries in terms of of trying to figure out what kinds of things work because I've heard from patients who do work with the dispensaries and try and figure I, out and say, well, this strain works for this and this worked for me, but this doesn't work for me. And so I'm confused about how the system doesn't allow patients and dispensaries to work together. I think that it's a very um, individual um, experience. Mm -hmm. And everybody's condition is different. Mm -hmm. And there are so many variables within um, cannabis. And um, for me personally, I take oils that are produced in the state of Maine mm -hmm. that I can't get here. Mm -hmm. I try oils from the dispensaries. They weren't produced the same way mm -hmm. that the oils are produced that are coming from Maine. So I actually um, didn't have access to the product mm -hmm. that works for me. Right. Um, had I not found my caregiver in Maine, I don't know if I'd be here right now. Um, Without the knowledge of <clears throat> individual caregivers and people there sorry. Okay. 
I think, yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, finding the right fit of a organic good product that I want to put into my body to heal me. Um, it, it doesn't have pesticides on it. Um, I don't want pesticides. So I don't know that I can utilize Vermont system if we're using pesticides. Um, and I question whether or not that's medicine. Um, to, 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 to say you have access to this, but you have to make the concession to accept that you are going to be ingesting pesticides. Does Maine not allow pesticides at all? Um, I don't know in the whole state. I know personally where I get my medication. It is 100% organic. And I know what I'm putting in my body. And, and I think that I should know what I'm putting in my body. And that isn't available here, you know? And, and that's really important to me. I'm not sure I understand that, but. If, mm -hmm. so the pesticides that are used here are OMRI approved, so they would be certified organic if there was a certification for cannabis. Okay. And same in Maine, they're using organically approved pesticides there's a whole it doesn't have anything to do with toxicity mm -hmm. it's just about where the pesticide came from okay so what about um, contaminated crops how do you handle that um, as far as your testing goes in the state how am I assured that I'm getting something that's clean Go ahead and answer. Sorry. Just that quickly. Yeah, so yeah. what we've allowed for use are all OMRI approved or do not leave a residue. And there's a strong use of beneficials as well. So I have spoken with folks in Maine and they're running into the same <coughs> issues. We do inspections and we know there aren't any pesticides in their storage areas that would be not allowed. Um, and I know, I know this issue occurs in Massachusetts, Maine, all over, anywhere cannabis is grown. People are using pesticides that would not be approved for use. Um, luckily, the dispensaries here are vertically integrated. Um, and you know what they've used on their product, that doesn't always occur. But I, I do have empathy for what you're saying. Um, that, that vertical integration, though, creates a system where they're watchdogging each other and they're watchdogging themselves. And why are they taking the samples that they're giving to be tested? So the GPS was already taken. Oh, no, you're taking the okay. So I question whether or not that is a valid sample. I, ju I, I think right, so that there are things that are lacking in, in, in so many ways that hinder the program. It's not the dispensary's fault. It's not the patient's fault. Well, it's we it's, did, we did that, <laughs> yeah. so, but we had we had to start someplace. Yeah, we had. But we can't continue to expand what hasn't been working. Well, there's the testing piece that will be going into place through so, the Department of Public Safety. But, but, are but you is that testing? Is the but is that testing if they are choosing what's being tested? No, they could uh, do spot checks. They yeah, they can, but they're doing spot checks that the dispensary takes the samples for. No, if I understood said, that that was the testimony that, that was just made. Transported by DPS. Yes, DPS. Or under the current proposal, what you're talking about right now is under the current system. There's no, there's no Ralph Nader model. There's no third-party testing. I, I agree. You're changing that. You're changing. Right. So, all right. I mean. 
I th we would love to have the ideal system, but <clears throat> given the fact that it was an illegal product to begin with, and we had we felt we had to do start someplace and then make changes, and we're making changes and um, as things come up, and it isn't ideal for everyone. I I acknowledge that, um, uh, and I I don't know how. So if you have suggestions about how we should change the whole system, are you suggesting we do away with dispensaries? I'm suggesting that you have to have a caregiver system. Well, we that do is have why I think she's thinking of a different model. We don't have an expanded model. We don't have any. Okay. Oh, you mean somebody can be a caregiver for we have like seven minutes? Okay. 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 So, okay. I think you're interested in expanding the <coughs> dispensary system to, to caregivers, caregivers, allowing them to do everything that dispensaries are brought, doing. Is that what I'm hearing? So the patients are taken care of. So that the, the, the caregivers can provide the product for the, if that's what you're saying? I, wa I want to be taken care of. Okay. I want okay. a caregiver like I have a new one. Yeah. I want to stay in my yeah. state for my medicine. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Not, that's not in the bill that we're considering right now. We're considering all these other things. But, too. but what you're Expanding doing is bill. you're losing your empathy for the patient. The patient is the one that is losing here. Medication is more expensive here. I don't have the caregiving that I have, so I have to go get it in me. Don't you want to be a state that can be I don't know. A, a state that's Maine. looked at as a program that is a good program? I mean, it oh. seems to me like you just want to make, you just want to piece it together so it can just kind of stay out there, kind of working. I don't think and Why not create a system that works for I everyone? Have, I have to admit, and I don't want to argue with you, but we have done hearings all around the state on this issue. Heard from many, many people who are get who are working with the dispensaries and are more than satisfied. And I'm sure there are some as yourself who didn't have a good experience. And that that's unfortunate, but I know that there are many people who are being cared for uh, who are getting their product out of the dispensaries and are glad of it. I mean we we've seen people who've had their lives improved tremendously by being able to get a product. So, you know, I see what you're saying. It's a different model that you'd like to have in place. This bill, are you against this bill where we would expand what we're doing now? Is that what you're saying? I am okay. against this. I think you can't expand a program that isn't working. Yet. Okay, okay, we've got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're all done. Okay. Uh, was there somebody else that wanted to say one line? <laughs> Medical program didn't work for me either, all the way from getting a doctor to agree to get into the bureaucracy of it. Uh, my name's Rob McFed, not at MS. And uh, yeah, my doctors were all hesitant to get involved. And that was early on with the medical program. Um, it was a little bit different then. Uh, it would probably be easier now, but I don't need a medical program. I can do it on my own. At, so at, now at, 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 at a quarter of the cost with better availability of products. I mean, now that you can grow your own. Well, now that you can okay. grow your own, and there's the gray and black market. Oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. to go through the Vermont medical program. There's what just too, many, too many hurdles. This is how I made does it. This is my main medical, medical certificate. I'm also made so you're, you're on your own. Yeah, I just take care of myself. Okay. Yes. But I would like the expansion of the, of the caregiver system. I believe that's necessary for the patients that haven't been served that don't get it very often. They don't get hurt because they simply don't get hurt. Senator Nick, that's, I'm not, not uh, decrying what the other patients have said to you. To think that a, an organization can take care of the genetics, the bodies is growing, uh, the retail, uh, the extraction, and everything from beginning to end, and have a wide variety of products, 
that's just too much to put on a new business, and that's what the dispensaries are dealing with right now. You know, they can't offer all the strains that are needed for um, covering all the patients. And they have to be extractors, they have to manufacture their products, they have to grow, they have to sell, they have to manage inventory. That's a pretty big organization that didn't exist before. They just had to pop up and serve the patients of the state. And it's, I don't think it works out too well. Well, and I don't think. <laughs> I don't know why. We, we could have just done a, an just expanded done caregiver um, model, which we didn't. We we chose not to do that. We chose to do dispensaries instead, or we could have done nothing and just not done dispensaries at all, and not just done anything at all. not done anything at all. I think a combination just, of the two. Well, but so we can consider that, but that has to. We we did not do the expanded caregiver model when we when we did it. That was a choice, and we the choice was because we need if we wanted to do anything we had to get a pass out of this body, and I'm I'm telling you that for 50 years people have been scared of this product, and so getting anything passed out of here to even start was a major major step. It was. I mean, I was here when we passed that. I was not here when we, I guess my first year was when we passed that allowed medical marijuana in the first place. But, and I agree that, I mean, I, I would like to actually treat it like tomatoes, but we can't, so there, that's where we are. Okay, we've got okay. to break up because oh. you left something in writing, right? I, I no, no, no. Oh, no just, he just showed, showed me this card no. from Maine. I, I was, I'm oh. showing you a card from Maine. It's also a way for Vermont to uh, deal with the issue of out-of-state patients as well. What you do is you uh, have your physician contact the Maine system. They fa fax, they form to your physician. Your physician signs it here oh, in Vermont. You want the and then you're allowed to, to use the Maine caregiver you mean system. You want the physician here in Vermont to sign up They do. The they Maine have a, they sign up for the Maine program. It's yeah. free. We can't always really get physicians even to sign up with an out-of-state medical program. So I don't think that's such that would be a little easy different, solution. Yeah, that's there, well, that's been for. resistance. Uh, right. I understand. That. I understand, sir. Yeah. Um, I, I think just what yeah. we, if we opened up to all Do you want this bill or not? Yes, ma'am. If we open up to all conditions, though, I would appreciate that. And if we could open the caregiver systems beyond one person per, per patient, okay. that would be really great. That's really what my okay, goal is. Other than that, I agree okay. with everything else you've said. Well, I haven't seen the bill, but I'm interested in the CBD side of the whole thing. And I'm just wondering whether this is connected to that at all no, or not. No. Not at all. Not okay. Not at all. And where do you go for something like that, though? The, co -op. the, local, the local corner store. You Bridgewater mean for CBD? Store. Well, I, I actually produce products with CBD, but there is like a lot of backlash with that part of it. The co -op. Um, federal the government. Oh, I thought you meant oh, where to buy it. Yeah. You buy it. I thought you meant where to buy it. Well, I know where to buy it. Oh. I know how to get it. Yeah. I'm just wondering as far as, you know, State laws and where where that's well, standing right now. Well, the farm bill made it legal. Sorry, I'm trying to help you. Guys, to I have to be upstairs, and when I leave, yeah. the form is gone. So well, I have, to, I have to. I also have, have to go. Um, <coughs> I think all that I need to be appreciated. Yeah. 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 Yeah.